one that's been chewed on a little bit and is starting to stress from the cold weather. And they're, they're still too high in tannins to eat raw, but you can try nibbling on it. And chestnut is the most edible member of the oak family, that and hazelnut. And you can tell that they're chestnuts and hazelnuts are members of the oak family because they have that same formation like a like an acorn that has the little spot on the top where the cap rests and then there's the brown anomaly coating over the rest of it. You'd want to cook these normally? What you would do is you'd either um, wash them for a day uh, as a ma you'd make a mash out of them and put the mash in a in a cloth bag in a stream and let the stream run through the bag and wash all the tannins out or you can change the boil several times which is a okay. lot more work and doesn't preserve as many of the nutrients mm -hmm. This is a red coat. This has much smaller acorns that are much higher in tannins. I mean, you can basically eat these. They're not great, but the red oaks, you know, have like a very astringent kind of gross flavor. Is it like unhealthy to eat them, or they just don't taste well? They're, they're, they'll give you a stomach ache if you eat, if you tried to eat a significant amount of them, but you just it doesn't taste good so you probably wouldn't eat enough to make you get sick <laughs> but they were you know one of the main protein sources for most native peoples the world over they just took the women working all day to make flour from them so that was you know kind of what kept people from having more free time in many cultures was processing things like acorns yeah and that's part of the reason why people you know, have you're not the kind of person who can hold your shit in. Like every time you say something, uh, you know, kind of like a lazy cultural cultural lifestyle is because for thousands of years we worked so hard to produce protein for ourselves. And now we're like, ah, finally we can rest. <laughs> not that I agree that we should, but it's one explanation for it. This is, I think, a Siberian giant sunflower right here. And when the the sunflower seeds are still white, you can eat the shell and all. You have to pick them out with two fingers. So the seeds are starting to get a little bit um, fibrous, but when they're just a little bit more immature than this, you can kind of eat like corn. And you can actually grind the entire sunflower head when the, before the shells harden and make a flour from it and make burgers from it. And because it's a member of the Astro family, it's very high in it. In what? Inulin, which is a pH neutral blood sugar, um, so it doesn't cause blood sugar spiking, and it's a prebiotic, so it feeds the lactobacillus in your digestive system without feeding yeast and other microbes that uh, inhibit digestion. This is kind of interesting. This is a poisonous vine um, from North America that's just starting to be used as a landscaping plant, which I think is kind of strange because it grows out of every crack in the sidewalk. This is Virginia creeper, and most Virginia creeper has five leaves that form a palmate cluster, but this one is producing three leaves in some places, and single leaves, almost like a grapevine, in other places. And I usually only see this in urban areas. This is an adaptation to urban areas, and it may be trying to look like English ivy so it's not pulled out. That's the <laughs> only thing I can imagine, because more, there's usually more wind passage in cities, so you'd think the divisional leaf would be a better adaptation for a high wind environment, but for some reason they've chosen this adaptation for city environments. This is another
another mulberry, yeah. And this one, you can see there's... I mean, the, the thing is, is anytime you have a mulberry growing out of stone or the base of another plant, it's probably a white mulberry because it's a high drainage environment. Red mulberries prefer wood edges and floodplains. So they like, they like a, a very hydrated environment. Um, but yeah, I would imagine this is probably a white mulberry. Parts of it are edible? Yeah, you can, so. you can use the leaf as a tea. It's high in inland. You, mostly uh, the aster family is high in inland, but you can, uh, you can use white mulberry leaves. If it's a red mulberry though, the leaves have a poisonous alkaloid in them that'll make you throw up and lose it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Ladies thumb or smart leaf. And this is the most edible of the wild grains. This is a grass family plant, even though it's a leafy member of the grass family. And you can eat these grains without having to hold them, which is atypical of grains. That's a garlic mustard. Oh, because that's the same thing we saw earlier. Yep. Unfortunately, it doesn't have very many leaves left, and, uh, well, this one has a few leaves. It has some fruit on it. Uh, that shrub right there, although it has, it has some uh, clematis growing over it is a um, Chinese quince and uh, those yellow fruits on there are Chinese quince fruits and that's a variety of quince which is very high in vitamin C and very tart and you have to cook with it and add fructose <coughs> or you can actually cut it up and put it into a vegetable dish and the alkaloids in the vegetables will neutralize it enough to make it palatable so that's growing on this shrub right yeah and that that flower is pink, orange, or yellow. I mean, a pink, orange, or red in the spring, and occasionally it'll flower again in the fall. They're Chinese quince, but they're well adapted for this region is because China, in, except for the Gobi Desert, is also very moist. Yeah. And you, Chinese dogwood, and Chinese quince are the ones that have been doing the best since we've gotten so much rain uh, for the last several years, except, for, of course, for last year, which was a drought year. Um, and uh, the, the tartar of the Rosaceae usually do better because the tannic acid preserves them in deoxygenated conditions. The flavor is really nice. It's yeah. Just, it's just tart. Yeah. Sweet too. And then this right here is a apple tree, which is a Central Asian from Kazakhstan Rosaceae species um, that's much less moisture tolerant. And you can see it's got all of this. Yeah fungal stress on it and it dropped all of its fruit before they matured. It finally got a few fruit on it this season but not doing it well. No. Yeah. This is nine bark. This is a native shrub that uses the landscaping plant and it's got colorful foliage. Are you nine nine bark? I think it's a viburnum. Yeah. This right here is a type of coleus. This is a wild coleus. Um, and there's different plants in the coleus family. This is another wild coleus. Uh, Shiso is a Korean coleus. And then there's Cuban mint, which is a Caribbean coleus. And then there's the decorative coleuses. And then there's Chia, is a Central American coleus. And Chia is a source, and so is Perilla or Shiso. Those are both, the seeds of those are sources of omega fatty acids. So you can 
eat the whole plant of this, but the seeds are the part to really go for because they're high in omega fatty acids. It looks kind of like a mint. It yes, coleus is a branch of the mint family. Oh, it's a mint. Yeah. This is, I believe, a hybrid tea rose, which is a graft. And these are some of the larger rose hips. They're not quite hardy to this region, so they usually decompose before they ripen. Um, this is the type of rose hip you would be able to eat in Northern California in the middle of the winter. But the, the petals on these kinds of rose are really good, especially when you mix them with honey. Huh. Is that common across roses? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They taste kind of like white peaches, except without the sweetness. So if you mix them with honey, they taste just like white peaches. Also, kind of like hawthorn. And for using rose hips and fruit, should they also produce sugar? Ideally? Yeah, ideally they should produce sugar so they should be soft. Um, usually people uh, separate seeds out and then dry the, the fruit for you. And this is a particular adaptation that, as far as I have seen, only this hedge has, which is a donut shaped berry. <laughs> and it makes it easier to get the seeds out without damaging the fruit. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. start to ripen in late August and they'll often be fruiting through November. They really like moisture which is not common to fruits. Most fruits uh, prefer the dry periods between rains um, for ripening, especially rosaceae. Oftentimes you'll get dampening off of rose fruiting in wet periods but this likes fruits likes moisture so much that sometimes the fruit, fruits will split during a rain because it's taking up so much moisture and the fruits get very big when it rains. Ginkgo will push them out, and that's why ginkgo is considered something that helps memory. Because it, it helps you uh, reconnect the gaps between the neurons when they're blocked. And it helps when, when the synapses are blocked, the neurons misfire and cause damage to the myelin sheath. So this repairs the myelin sheaths you, as it clears you out the synapses. The leaf, you make a tea out, you make a tea out of the leaf. But the, this is a male, so it doesn't have any fruit, but the fruit is very smelly. And as a result, they try not to plant them in cities, but sometimes they do anyway. And, um, and the, but if you remove the fruit, there's a green nut inside, which is a good fat and protein source in the wintertime. And there's uh, one that has fruit all over the ground, uptown along Main Street, a couple of hills. The fruits are orange, 